Cool. So welcome to the DevOps and Patterns and Anti-Patterns talk that Baruch and I are going to give. Um, I'm Steven Chin. I run the developer relations team at JFrog. And I'm Baruch. I'm head of developer advocacy in JFrog. And um, what, what can possibly go wrong? Oh, uh, a lot. But if you follow us on Twitter, at Steven Java and at JBaruch, you'll probably be able to handle it because we will help you. <laughs> okay. Right? Okay, let's dive into it. Um, I think the, the first question we need to ask is, why the hell at all people want to update their software? I mean, yeah, can I, we I, just... I, I like to keep my, my stuff as outdated as possible. That way I know it works, right? If I don't update it, it keeps working. So I think there are examples, and I need to Google it one day, of software that was last updated in the 70s and still work. I don't know, some Linux utilities that just do the job, and there is nothing to update about them. But that's, not, that's really not the mainstream. The mainstream of software is continuously being updated, and I would say that's because of two reasons. And the first reason is users want features. Yeah, that's a problem with users. You shouldn't have any users for your software. If you don't have any code, you don't need to <laughs> update it. And then you don't... Well, there is a blog post, if you go to jeffrey.com slash blog, about when do you don't need updates. And it has those... It has, has, those, exactly it has those, those criteria. Those criteria. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Don't have code, don't have So basically bugs, software have, nobody uses. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Right? So, but if you do have users, obviously users and features, and the f they want those features... No, right? They want them now, they want updates as soon as possible. And I think the best example of this culture of wanting the features now is what we experience with our smartphones. Yep. Remember the days of Nokia? Oh uh, yeah, those are the good old days. Oh yeah, the good old days. If you didn't have Snake on your phone, what did you do if you wanted Snake? Spot a new phone. Spot a new phone, yeah. right? There, is, there was not much on update of software. Well, you could go to a special store, a very special store, and buy a data cable. Mm -hmm. Remember the data cable? Mm -hmm. uh, but could you do anything with it, really? Um, well, it couldn't charge your phone. No, no, that's another cable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only thing that you could do with data cable is export your contacts when you actually bought a new phone with a snake and you wanted your old phone. Yeah, contacts. that's true. You need to get your contacts from the old phone to transfer to the new phone. You that's what you do with data cable. So you could play snake. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But still, still no software update. But then everything changed with, the, with an iPhone, mm. right? You had a proper operating system with proper software, which could actually be updated. But the update was like still manual. I remember you had to check every couple of days and there is a new feature yeah, uh, yeah. or new version. And, and then probably you restart go. and all whole process. Right. But now it's all automatic, mm -hmm. which is very cool because we have a shift in the value of our devices. Um, with the Nokia phone, uh, once you bought it, the next second, it actually was worth less because it was already outdated. And especially when there was a, a new model with the Snake, your phone was actually much, uh, cost much less or was value much less than the new one. With our software being updated and especially updated automatically, and our devices, instead of depreciating, actually appreciating. Because with every day that you have new feature, your device now can do much more. So you're saying my old Nokia phones sitting in my closet aren't worth much? Aren't worth much. Uh, well, you can, uh, you can use it as a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, they are built well. They're really solid. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And while with, with, with phones, we don't really appreciate the appreciation, that was a nice pun, um, because we kind of used to it from the computers, obviously we update the software and everything. Think about cars. Mm -hmm. Think about Tesla, for example. That's not a car, though. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's a um, software device which happens to have wheels. Exactly. And this is why you have a car now that appreciates with time. Once, once uh, 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 a year ago, it didn't know how to get itself from a tight parking spot. Now it knows. A year ago, it couldn't show your YouTube videos where you're charging. Now it knows. With any other car, you would actually have to buy an entire new car that has Apple um, CarPlay or, or Android Auto. Mm -hmm. Here, you just need to update the software. It does automatically, and your car becomes better with updates. So this is one very, very important example. Yeah. 
another example, another very important reason is security. Right? And this is a quote uh, from uh, from Kit Merker that actually says that now as every company becomes a software company, a software is eating the world. One of the biggest problems, as big as the oil spills in the 90s, is um, uh, our security vulnerabilities, right? Uh, how does that work? Every security vulnerability has number of, I would say, phases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think a, a good analogy for security vulnerabilities would be to think about um, car stopping distances. Or, motor, uh, or motorcycle, motorcycle, or motorcycle stopping distances. Yeah. So um, the time from, from when you fix, from when you identify to when you fix a security vulnerability can be thought about in terms of the amount of time it takes between when you see a potential accident and when you're actually able to stop. And um, when you look at this, there's the initial identification that you need to stop. And then there's the physical braking distance when you actually need to slow down the vehicle. And the combination of those two, your thinking distance plus your braking distance is how long it takes you to stop a car and avoid a dangerous situation. And this, this scales differently based upon how fast you're traveling. But it also has completely different physics in it, mm -hmm. right? Thinking distance is neurons firing in your brain as a reaction of light hitting your retina and what's not. And then braking distance is actually the brakes uh, making contact with the wheel and wheel making contact exactly. with, with the exactly. road. Exactly. So you can think the same speed at different um at different speeds you're driving, but you need more time for the vehicle to physically slow down. And then you have different type, different ways of battling uh, those distances and making it shorter, mm -hmm. right? For example, you can replace human with computer as, as a driver. Thinking distance ranks to milliseconds, obviously, yeah, yeah. right? You can do less with braking distance. The same with, with security vulnerabilities. There are different dynamics, there are different physics in play, and you can battle them with different ways to do it. Okay, so when you're looking at security, security vulnerabilities, the process you have to go through is identify the security vulnerability, then you have to implement a fix which will actually solve the security vulnerability, and then you have to deploy and actually get that to production. And like the car example, all of these things take different amounts of time based on the type of security vulnerability, what sort of um, software you're developing and the deployment process you have for your product. And there's some very classic and horrible examples of how wrong this can go. Um, so one example of this was um, a vulnerability in a hospital where they were trying to solve it and it took them years to even identify that they had an issue so um, hospitals were having issues with folks uh, where they were turning away emergency patients they were suffering from ransomware attacks and just to identify why this was happening took them years and when they actually identified it they realized that they were on a really old version of windows and they had to do an os upgrade to solve the problem Again, the OS upgrade took them quite a while to go through and actually upgrade all the computers because they were quite outdated. They weren't keeping up with current software updates. Um, and this physical deployment took years in the hospitals. And this was years of patients being turned away from hospitals because of a software issue. So, so. yeah, so as, a, as an example with, with the thinking distance and the breaking distance, we, we, we have here completely different mechanics in play, right? So identifying a potential vulnerability, this is, you know, the security mm -hmm. people, the hackers, blue hat, green hat, whatever hats are doing that, and, and the bad guys find those exploits. And in this example, the exploit was in Windows XP, which obviously was exploited many years ago. So... It, it's been there for years. The fix is obviously completely different mechanics. It might be coding, so you need the developers to patch the vulnerability, and that again was done many years ago. Once new Windows of a new version of Windows was out. Exactly. So the, 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 in this case, the fix was really quick because the OS upgrade existed, but the actual deployment to the hospitals took quite a long time given their infrastructure. And this is actually a DevOps skill, the yep. deployment part. Yep. Right, so we have the security skill, we have the development skill, and we have the DevOps skill all come together to fix a vulnerability. Yeah, so another example of this classic one is Equifax, where they had a, a huge um, vulnerability, which was a massive security breach on their database. 
It took them a couple of months to even identify that they had an issue and admit it. Um, the fix was already known. So there was an existing issue in struts. Um, the patch already existed. So they just had to apply this and upgrade to the latest version of struts. But again, while well, the fix didn't take long, it took them a couple months to actually do the deployment to production. And um, this, this is the sort of stuff which destroys your business. If you can't resolve a critical security vulnerability, then you just have money leaking out of the building while you're waiting to fix it. Yep. And, and, and although you might think by now that those are all old news and obviously well government run um, hospitals are slow and then you know those government baked um, uh, agents are, are slow but we are agile startup that can battle with everything very very fast I have uh, bad news for you and those news actually broke out in January last three uh, last year you probably remember a meltdown inspector attacks mm -hmm. um, of those two um, spect uh, meltdown was uh, more in the news because the exploit was embarrassingly simple. A couple of uh, JavaScript uh, lines of code allow you to read a uh, processor memory uh, in the protected areas that you should yeah, get access, uh, which was very painful and embarrassing. But also the fix was very quick. All the major operating systems patched their systems in, in a matter of weeks. Um, Spectre got less attention because it was harder to exploit, but for for the sake of our discussion, it's much more um, uh, much more problematic. Uh, Spectre exploits best practices of your development um, process to uh, speculatively assume what memory can be populated with which values, and this is a problem because it means that the better code you write, the more vulnerable you are to Spectre class attacks. And what it also means that it is actually impossible to defeat because those speculations can be assumed in any point of time. Some of them won't be operational, but some of them might be operational and you can have a Spectre class attack popping out a zero day exploit. You cannot protect against it in any point of time. Mm -hmm. And what it means is the only way to deal with it is is act as fast as possible. Yep, so you have to change the software and actually update to avoid the flaw. Right, so you need to identify that you know that you're being attacked, mm -hmm. and that's again someone else's expertise. You need to write the code to patch it, and that's someone so else's that's expertise. But when we're talking about everything is done, we found we're under attack, we fixed the attack, deploying it is about what we are speaking about today. So this sounds pretty grim, I think we're all doomed. Well, almost, but not really. <laughs> uh, Nicole spoke today in her keynote um, about the state of DevOps. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, the new report, the new uh, DORA state of DevOps report is out for, for, for a month now. And um, obviously, if you, don't, need this, if you don't, don't know this report, that's the most important uh, reading you, you will do, uh, I don't know, throughout the year, but for sure. Um, in, in, in some period of time. It's a very, very serious um, survey. Uh, th more than 31,000 um, uh, responses. And it actually shows that we are not doomed. Um, Nikon separates the answers by cohorts uh, from low performance all the way to elite performance. Elite performance, as of today, is 20% of the industry. Mm -hmm. Every fifth organization are elite performance and the elite performance know how to do that. They actually manage to deploy multiple deploys a day on demand. This is, this is days, not years. That's days as in not years. And that actually means that when those elite performance are attacked, mm -hmm. once they are identified and fixed the problem, they deploy multiple times a day to actually fix it. So this is this is how you this is how you solve it, and it means that everything is not as grim. And it's actually not surprising that every fifth organization doing that, because this concept was is with us for many years now. 1998, extreme programming came out mm -hmm. with this idea of short feedback. Mm -hmm. 2000, agile, Scrum, reducing cycle time to absolute minimum. Um, Toyota production system, decided that it's possible and deliver as fast as possible. Kanban, incremental change. All those practices that we now praise and practice. No one does waterfall today. Everybody do that. They actually preach continuous updates as fast as possible.
Yeah, okay. So that's good. But um, how do we actually make updates happen faster? So I think we should look at an example of, an, of, of a project that tries to update faster. Okay, so maybe we'll pick on um, Java and Mark well, Reinhold. You have Java right in your Twitter handle. That's on you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Java changed the release cadence recently. So it's for a long time, um, Java was releasing anywhere from claiming to be two years to in practice being five to seven years on actual release dates. And this is one of the things which... Um, as a large technology platform, which everything sits on top of, you have security vulnerabilities coming out, you have critical features which folks need to implement, and if you don't move faster, then you're not going to be able to keep up as a dominant language in the industry. So um, they change the release cadence from every three to five years to every six months on a train model. Um, the first release for this was Java 9, um, Java 10 came out six months after, Java 11 came out six months after, we're up to Java 13 currently, and um, this both provides a stronger cadence for fixing security vulnerabilities, but also for getting features out. So you're not waiting, for example, in the case of modularity, I believe it was first announced at a DevOps conference, like, I want to say 12 years ago? Yeah. A really long time ago? Yeah, yeah. It. it from that point, it actually took 10 years to make it out in Java 9 and actually be a production feature. And that's, the world is not going to wait 10 years for you to get your features out. So you mentioned that it was recently, and time flies. It was actually two years ago. Uh, and, and since then, a lot of, a lot of Java yeah, versions yeah. came out. Like every, every... Starting with 9, where modularity came out, and then every... Right, so we have, we have basically four versions. This was when Java 8 was the latest mm -hmm. version. Now Java 13 is the latest mm -hmm. version. And I assume, based on all what we spoke about, uh, how continuous updates are important, that the majority of the industry now should be on Java 13 because everybody wants faster updates. Mm. So we go to our friends and yeah, train and uh, ask. I don't know uh, about that. Well, there it is. 83% didn't bunch. They're still on Java 8 that was out when actually that was announced. And this is when we ask each other what happened. Yeah. What about all those stories of great features and security vulnerabilities and what's not that faster release cadence should solve, but no one seems interested? To answer this question, we need to ask ourselves, how do we update? How do we decide whether we want to update software or not? And this slide, for some bizarre reason, is from right to left. Uh, that's probably my Israeli yeah, roots. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, we have update available. You know, okay. there, is, there is a notification, new, new version. Should we take it or not? The first question is, do we even want it? Do that's, they that's have, a good question. Are there some interesting features? Yeah. If we don't want it, well, no, we won't, we won't okay. take it. Okay, that's, that's what happened to Java 9. Uh, well, <laughs> that will happen to Java 9. There were no interesting features, but sometimes there are interesting features, mm. so we want them. Yeah. The next question would be, are there any high risks? Oh. There are examples of software without high risk, and then, sure, let's update. There is no high risk. I will uh, update my Netflix app on my phone without thinking, because even if it's broken, I'll just go to YouTube and watch cartoons while they fix it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Why not? Now, if there are high risks, the question is, do we trust that this upgrade update will go smoothly? Mm -hmm. So that's a question, and the answer, if we trust the update, uh, then, then of course it's no problem. And I try to come up with an example of update that you blindly trust. Um, Maybe Mac OS like five years ago. You yeah. remember those days? Yeah, yeah it was but like, not, not today. Yeah, it was like new version of Mac OS, let's just take it, it will work, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's, all, that's all over. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, I mean, that's a good example. We, we, we used to do that, mm -hmm. but, but, but not anymore. And the reason why, why we don't trust software at all, and even the software that we used to trust, we don't trust anymore. Mm -hmm. And can it be like quality? Um, yeah, so... Maybe we don't. Maybe, maybe people just suck in, in testing. 
Or maybe companies have decided that we as the consumers are the QA. Well, that might very well be. The question is why? And I think the answer is complexity. Our software mm -hmm. becomes more and more complex and it's by nature harder and harder to test. And we at JFrog obviously measure everything with artifacts and, and, and software packages. And I think the number of artifacts is a good symptom for complexity. It all started back then in 2000 when we mentioned Agile. Agile is about, okay, let's release smaller features faster. So we obviously have more artifacts. And then, okay, we do it with continuous integration. Now we build every, um, after every commit or at least every day. And now continuous delivery, mm -hmm. um, every artifact might end up going to production, so we'd better save it somehow and manage it. And then infrastructure as a code, now we manage our servers as software packages as well. And then microservices, instead of doing um, big applications, let's do a lot of small applications, more complexity. Docker, obviously, every line and change in my Docker file end up with tons of huge blobs. And then serverless, now every three lines of JavaScript code need to interact with yeah. each other as artifacts. And what about devices? And, and, and then devices. I mean, now Kubernetes runs on, on every light bulb in my in my house. Yeah, yeah. At, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of complexity. That's no, a lot of complexity. No wonder we don't trust updates. Right, so here, here's one answer. Maybe the software is, is, is complex. But on the other side, you know what? We know how to test complex software. It's just software, those are just algorithms. We know how to code against those algorithms and assume their behavior and mm -hmm. test that their behavior is correct. So I would say this is not a good excuse. What is really a good excuse is the amount of data. So this is a, a research uh, sponsored by uh, Seagate. They do hard drives, so it's kind of biased. Mm -hmm. uh, take it with a ground of salt, but still they claim that by 2025, we will have 175 zettabytes so on global data sphere. What's a zettabyte? Zettabyte is a lot. So what the biggest like kind of chunk of data you can think about now? Um, good. Petabyte? Ter ter terabyte? Petabytes, a thousand terabytes, Yes. Right? So pe okay, petabytes? Ter terabyte is big, but like you, when you think like yeah, Google, yeah, yeah, you think yeah, yeah, petabytes. Petabytes. Okay. petabytes. okay, after petabytes, there is exabytes. Okay, so a thousand petabytes is an exabyte. And then after exabytes, there are zettabytes. So, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot, and this is where complexity is. It's not about our code, it's about data, and that means that there is no way in the world that you can possibly create staging environment for mm -hmm. your testing that mm -hmm. would even remotely be something like your production environment. There is no, there is no way. So I think that's the reason why we don't trust. So now when we know it, let's go back to our diagram, we don't trust it. Mm -hmm. The next question is, can we verify the update? Sometimes the answer is, you know what, it will take me too long. Yeah. If I, th if I look at Java 9, yeah. and I look at updating all our Java production servers, all our clients and everybody, mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, I need to make sure that nothing breaks. It will probably take me about half a year, by yeah. half a year I will have Java 10. Why would it even bother? Yeah. Right? Sometimes I want to verify it, I want to spend my time, but then it will be a very time consuming mm. verification. So in the end of the day, on, the, on, the, on, the, on this part, should I verify or not? The end question is, do I have enough food on the table to justify the update? Mm -hmm. Right, so we, we end up with a trade-off. And the trade-off is between features that we really want and acceptance test costs. Okay, um, so that, that sounds too complicated. Is there, a, is there a way we can work around this? Yes, there is a cheat. And this cheat, we live with this cheat every day. And it goes as following. Update available, mm -hmm. do we want it? Okay. Nobody asked you. Oh. The auto update is on, but only under the assumption that there are no high risks, mm -hmm. right? Let's pretend that the high risk software does not exist. In this paradigm, we're fine with automatic updates. Okay. And I'll ask you a couple of questions. Do you know which version of your browser you're running? Um, no, I don't. 
You don't. By the way, do you know what version of PowerPoint these slides are running? Um, unfortunately, because I'm in an outdated version, I do know on my computer, but no, I don't know. <laughs> How about Twitter that is on the different screen than my brother? You know, I have no clue. That's like a... uh, do you have a Twitter on your smartphone? Yeah. Do you know which yeah, version yeah, of it? No, no. How about your the version of your smartphone? Um, yeah, I, I kind of know that, but but again, I'm I'm the edge case because I um, I jailbreak things. So with smartphone OS, you are not as edge case you are because most of the people know because updating your smartphone OS is a high risk operation. Mm -hmm. So there is no auto update. There is always like, okay, new operation system is out. Do you want to update? And you're like, ah, uh, this is my trade-off. Remember, mm -hmm. new features, shiny features. It will break everything, and I will lose everything. That's that's the trade-off kicking right in. Yeah. So it yeah. works. So that gets rid of. There are high risks. Exactly. And yeah. then if we if we kind of ignore it, then everything's fine. But if we look at it, mm -hmm. we 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 have a problem. Yeah. So how do we solve it? We solve it with the concept that's called continuous updates. Mm. And continuous updates are like every other update, but we actually do it very frequently. Mm -hmm. So if we break something, we can immediately fix. We do it automatically. So uh, we, we, we won't allow any human mistake in the process. We make sure that it's tested. We spoke about it. We know how to test complicated systems. We have problem with data. And to figure that out, we will use Hanaro releases, which means we release to a small uh, mm -hmm. number of your customers, uh, minimizing the, 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 the uh, blast radius uh, when anything went wrong, and then we know how to roll it back. We are aware of the state of our, of our end device, so we can uh, write the update correctly. Uh, we observe what's going on in order that if anything went wrong, we can uh, roll back or send a new patch. And, uh, and that's kind of an extra credit task. We should implement, in some cases, local rollbacks. Okay. So, we won't, so even, we won't even rely on an update to fix a problem. Yeah, very good. Because if you had a device which broke itself and couldn't connect to the network, you need a local update or it would be broken. Exactly, right? So this is, but, but that's kind of extra credit. This is hard. Yeah. If you do everything else, I can give you a slack on local, local rollback. <laughs> <laughs> right? And if you do this, then going back to our diagram, do we want it? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. No high risks, that's fine. But even if they are higher risks, the trust is there because mm -hmm. you did all everything on my bucket list and now I'm as a customer can trust you that even if you break something, It'll you'll, just roll back? you'll yeah. either roll back immediately or you send me a patch. Yeah. Or if I'm not in the canary group, I won't even know yeah. that the better update actually got to, cool. to, to some of the people. So continuous updates, are the key for breaking this vicious cycle of uh, we are not updating because we are afraid, right? Mm -hmm. And this is another quote about our goal is to transition from bulk and rare software updates, this is where today, to extremely tiny and extremely frequent software updates to solve those problems, so tiny and so frequent that they provide an illusion of software flowing from development mm -hmm. to the update target. This sounds good, but what do you call this? We call it the liquid software vision. Oh. And we wrote a book about it. Uh, two of co-founders of JFrog, Fred Simon and Jov Landman, and um, yours truly. And everything is there. There is all the concepts of continuous updates, mm -hmm. very practical examples of how you do continuous updates and how you can actually build software that your user will trust and you will be able to send them those features and to battle those security risks by, by doing lifting software. Okay, so that sounds good, but is this for everyone? Well, there are corner cases, but there are fewer that you might think. So I'll give you an example, I'll ask you a question. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about continuously update a plane mid-flight? Um, am, am I on the plane? You are on the plane. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me try to convince you. Now, uh, you are in, um, uh, in some other role, there is a hacker mm -hmm. who managed to penetrate the network of the plane because the supply chain is broken, it's obvious. 
as usual. And now they are going to highlight, uh, hijack the playing mid-flight. And you have the ability by using Liquid Software to actually roll back the update that caused this security vulnerability that the hacker went through. Do you think that updating the plane mid-flight now is a good idea? Well, I'm okay with it. So this is exactly that. You didn't want it because you didn't trust, obviously, you know, what, what happens if the update is not good enough. Yeah. But if we're talking about trusted software, the updates are for the better. They're fixing things. Mm -hmm. They're patching things. They're keeping the hackers out. So there are very rare corner cases, but in general case, even if you feel uncomfortable with software update, you will feel better with it if you do it continuously and you implement liquid software. So with that, follow us on Twitter. I'm NJ Baruch. Yep, Steve on Java. And liquid software, the official hashtag of the liquid software revolution. And thanks for DevOx experience for having us to give this great talk. Please follow them with the hashtag. And um, you go to liquidsoftware.com to learn more about it. Yeah, cool. With that, thank you very much.